Um, I'm here today to talk to you about what I'm passionate about. And uh, what I'm passionate about is my profession, oral maxillofacial facial surgery. And in particular, innovations in oral and maxillofacial facial surgery. So what's oral maxillofacial facial surgery? Oral maxillofacial facial surgery is the surgery that deals with the face and the jaws, jaw bones. And uh, we deal with car accidents, we deal with uh, removing tumors in the face, we deal with anomalies, asymmetries, um, facial cosmetics, all that uh, within our profession. So, what's an innovation that I'm about to talk about? Innovation is anything that's new. It's a new idea, a novel device, or even if you come up with a better technique in order to meet market demand, to meet uh, any new requirements. That's an innovation. Ever since ancient Egyptians, we have known innovations. Uh, one of the earliest uh, known physician worldwide was Amhotep, uh, which means who he comes in peace. And he had multiple professions. He was not only a physician, he was a high priest, he was an architect, an engineer. The first known to mankind as far as being a physician is Hesi Ra. Hesi Ra was known to be the chief of dentists and physicians at the time of the pharaohs, 3,000 years BC almost. Since that time, they had innovations. Innovations such as surgical techniques, they knew something called trephination. Trephination is where we do small holes in the skull in order to decrease intracranial pressure. That's since the pharaohs. Circumcision, closure of wounds like stitching. All that was known ever since the pharaohs. And um, it was actually, you can see that inscribed over at the tomb of Komombo, and you'd find instruments that they actually made themselves and devised. And for them at the time, that's innovation. From era to era, we have developed surgery. We have developed surgery across eras, from the Egyptian, ancient Egyptians, down to the Greeks, the Romans, and, you know, in the last two centuries. But always, innovations is challenged. We're always having obstacles to innovations. And let me tell you a story that dates back to World War II, where innovation was really challenged. And it's about a, guy, a, a doctor, actually. He was an orthopedic surgeon. His name is Gavriel Ilizrov. Ilizrov is an orthopedic surgeon that was from Kurgan, Russia. At the time of World War II, Russia was part of what's known as the Soviet Union. And at the time of war, they used to get the surgeons in military planes and have them fly, and they would drop them down with a parachute in order to get to remote areas and treat patients. So Elizarov at the time developed that external fixator that you see. And that external fixator, he used to treat, you know, fractures and bones at the time of war. But from hard times, innovations develop. And he actually, the idea of this innovation came from the parachute. How it came from the parachute? Look at the external rings in the fixator and look at the parachute. You'd find around the waist, there is a ring. The parachute is the second ring, and the intersecting cords and stabilizing ropes are actually the same as the intersecting over there, the wires that are stabilizing the bones. And he came out with that innovation while parachuting. And I was lucky enough to know that story because I met his nephew while I was studying in the USA. Um, I was giving a lecture and I mentioned his name uh, and his techniques. And there his nephew comes up to me after we finish the talk and tells me I'm his nephew. And he showed me his name is Yili Zarov, so he has the same family name. And he tells me the story of the parachute, which was not written in any article or paper. It was only written in Russian. And I was able to get to know that story. 
But is that the only thing about Elizrof I want to make? No. The story is just starting. It's not about the external fixator device. No, it's much more than that. Sometimes innovation come accidentally, not just by hard times or anything. So Elizarov had a nurse. That nurse used to go to the patient where he fixated the fractures and used to, you know, you can see that around that device there are screws, bolts and nuts that you have to tighten on a daily basis and you kind of want to make sure that it's really tight so that the bones are compressed and it heals well. So what happened is that that nurse, instead of turning it clockwise, she started doing it anti-clockwise. And she did that for several days in a row. And when Elizarov came and saw what happened, he was kind of astonished. Actually, compression that was supposedly done would keep the segments and the bone to heal together. But actually, the tension on the bones created new bone, like you see here. This is the fracture, and that's new bone being laid down by applying constant tension to the bones. And that phenomena came out as distraction osteogenesis. So while distracting the segments of the bone, you're getting new bone laid down in between. And that story is the, the, the base of any bone lengthening procedure, okay? So Elizarov started working on that, those bone lengthening procedures and all his results would not be accepted. And you know what would they call him? They would call him the magician from Kurgan. Every time in history, even in the fairer time, they would read things to magic or something that wouldn't be accepted just because you're getting something out in you. And it wasn't until he treated an Olympic high jumper by the name of Valerie Brummel. Valerie Brummel was one of the more or less no, very well-known uh, high jumpers. And uh, at the time, he suffered a motorcycle accident. And he had to go for about 14 surgeries just to correct the deformity that he suffered in his lung bones. Valerie Brummel, as a last resort, an unsuccessful surgeries, 14 unsuccessful surgeries, he went to the magician from Kurgan. And the magician from Kurgan treated him two operations. And he was able, within six months, to return him back to training and to high jumping again. Now, let me talk to you about a more recent uh, innovation that we're using right now all the time. And it's actually the highlight of the fourth industrial revolution, 3D printing. 3D printing has come up out in the 90s, in 2000, industrially, of course. And then it started to have medical and dental applications. And this is the first case. I was lucky enough in 2001 that I had one of the earliest models in 3D printing. There were only two places in the United, entire United States that did 3D printing. And these were among the first models that were done at these institutions. And this is uh, a case for uh, uh, a 34-year-old uh, male who had a legion in his lower jaw. And that legion had eaten up all his lower jaw. And we wanted to print that 3D model in order to help outline, see where we're going to make the cuts of the tumor mass, and help us. Like you see, there's a plate here. And that plate, we wanted to pre-bend that plate outside the patient and go ready to put it inside the patient as pre-bent plate. At the time, that was an innovation. Now it's standard. That's standard procedure nowadays. But at the time, we did that, and we reported it, of course. And you can see how it can save an, a lot of time in the operating room. How can that provide more accuracy to us? Because we know exactly where to cut, and we're getting it ready. Pre-bending a plate such as this can take us an hour, an hour and a half in the OR. So we're actually decreasing the time in the operating room. So what else can 3D printing offer? Now, 
with the new technology, 3D printing can actually, you can bioprint tissues and organs, like an ear cartridge or a 3D printed heart, okay? Still under research, not out yet, but still under research and it's being done. We can do a customized implantable device like a titanium mandible, that we can do. And now there are expensive 3D printers that can print those tissues and organs. This printer is called a bioplotter, and it's that big and $300,000 worth. And that can print on a variety of different materials that are natural materials where we can incorporate inside the body. And that's a huge innovation. And now we're moving on, the last three years or four years, we're moving on to in-office 3D printing. So those models and those templates I can do myself in my clinic. I myself today have two 3D printers that I'm using on a weekly basis, at least. They are getting more accurate, more affordable. There are printers that used to cost between 200, 100 grand to $200,000. Now you can have printer between $4,000 to $10,000 that are offering quite a good quality to certain applications. So it's changing. You're getting to have it on hand and with you. And this way you can develop more and you can innovate more. From then, after 3D printing, we started realizing that we need more accuracy on the planning of the surgery itself. So came out, there came out a huge leap in virtual planning software. What I mean by virtual planning is we actually upload the comb beam CTs or the CT scans, the x-rays for the patient, onto the software then we kind of segmentalize the segments in the mandible, the maxilla, or the different parts of the face, and we kind of differentiate in segments. And then we start doing moves, or maybe cuts, virtual cuts, all in 3D space. So we're actually doing this in a 3D kind of space, and doing the final moves in 3D space on the software. After we do that, we move on to a device planning software where we want the virtual plan to go with us into the operating room. So we need to 3D print what you see here, these devices that you can see here, we want to take them inside the OR to give us exactly what the virtual plan has accomplished in order to provide the highest accuracy for the patient. And now we can 3D print those templates or, re or plates customized, we can 3D print them and take them into the OR. From there, we planned the surgery. After we planned the surgery, we 3D printed what we needed. But can we navigate inside the surgery? Then came surgical navigation. Surgical navigation started in the orthopedic literature and neurosurgery and then went into the craniomaxillofacial surgery literature. And now what's happening is actually you're having cameras and these instruments that the doctor is moving around the patient's anatomy and you can track those instruments inside on the screen and you can see how far they're moving from the patient. So you're actually navigating the surgery itself. So it's similar to a GPS. The GPS, you have the map. The maps here are the patient's x-rays. And the instruments here, the GPS system itself, is actually the instruments that we are moving back and forth. While you are in your car, you're being tracked by satellite. Okay? And you have the GPS system to be tracked. And you're moving along. The same thing, the instruments here as they move along around the patient's face, we can see where is it moving exactly. So if we're cutting, we can see on the monitor where exactly we're cutting, and that's called surgical navigation. It's still very expensive, but it's applied now. It's still going on further. So I just wanted to show you here that, for example, if we have a patient with uh, like an injured orbital floor. Orbital floor is the bone just beneath the eyeball. If it's injured on one side, what we do is we mirror image 
the injured side on the good side. So you'd have both mirror image the same way. Then with the software, we do a patient-specific device planning. And with surgical navigation, we can put the patient-specific implant in the right place as we virtually planned it. So you can see how innovation have blended together. So that was the current innovation that we're using. So what's upcoming innovations in our field? Augmented reality. When the doctor is looking at the screen, he cannot really, he's, he's working on the screen and working on the patient. So there's a lack of coordination or correlation between his eyes and what he's doing on the patient himself. So now there's a leap that's coming. It's still under study. I've been with the group who are uh, actually doing a lot of studies. Uh, they are in Bologna, Italy, headed by Dr. Bianchi, and they're doing fantastic work on augmented reality, yet it's still not out yet. But what they're trying to do is the doctor would wear those glasses, similar to, you know, the Google glasses and, you know, uh, and the Microsoft HoloLens. And when he put the glasses, he would see the virtual plan simulated on the patient himself. So you would actually have the planned surgery over the patient so I can see where exactly I will cut while the pain, or, or you could have a tablet even. There's another institute in Basel uh, in Switzerland that instead of having an augmented reality glasses, you would slide a tablet over the patient and you see the virtual plan on the patient's head himself. So that's a huge leap in you know, in, in our field. Lastly, about the upcoming innovation, I want to talk to you about haptics. Haptics, holograms, sense of touch. Haptics is a sense of touch. What happens is that the doctor has a hologram in front of him, and he starts getting a haptic device, similar to that arm you see here. And he starts touching the hologram and he start moving the parts on the hologram. And what he can do, for example, if you have a fracture here, he can come, pick up that segment, and with the haptic, put it and place it right where it's supposed to be, on the hologram, not on, even on the computer, on a simulated 3D hologram. And then he would feel a snap, a pushback, that will make him feel that it went in, in the right area. Like you can see here. You can see the guard or the gloves, the haptic gloves that he's wearing, and he's manipulating the 3D hologram. And you could get those segments like a jigsaw puzzle and help yourself to snap them into the right anatomy. That's what we're talking about in haptic technology and what's coming up very soon within the next three to five years. I'm not saying 10 years, 20 years. I'm talking three to five years. And now, haptics together with augmented reality are kind of getting together for educational purposes. Getting together so that you would be able to study anatomy and you can actually divide the muscle layer, be able to look more closely inside the heart and other organs, so actually the students of medicine or dentistry can easily visualize in a 3D level. And in this university here, we're actually doing that to help residents do understand surgical anatomy of the head and neck. And I have about four students who are highly interested in that part and working on the software to develop that for our area in the head and neck area. So what's the take home message today? Harboring innovation rather than challenging innovations. We are much more lucky than what the time of Elizarov where he had to take it took him 20 years in order for his own people to be convinced of what he has to do. And another 20 years language barrier war barrier, and others. Now we're lucky. We have all papers translated at the touch of our fingers. I could get the latest paper. We have people more interested in innovations and in getting us the most recent innovations. However, 
We need organizations. We need organizations to partner with entrepreneurs and actually provide the fund, provide the right network, provide the right tools for those entrepreneurs to be able to take the innovation into the market. So now, I've talked to you about haptics. I've talked to you about augmented reality, and that's in maxillofacial facial surgery. Aren't you a little bit curious what we will get in 20 more years? Thank you for listening. <laughs>